Hi, everybody. This is Rob Cosgrove of Remote Backup Systems. Um, today we're presenting a one-hour webinar on a number of topics that you have sent in uh, that you want us to talk about. Um, with me today is Guru Krishnan, who is uh, one of our lead uh, 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 engineers in India. Um, we, uh, we have a lot of questions that were sent in. And unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all of them, but we're going to get to the ones that, um, that most people have asked about. And we did get a lot of requests for the, the first couple of things we're going to do. Uh, but we do have other webinars scheduled. They're one per week through December the 19th. Um, we'll send out emails when, uh, when, uh, when we have links for you to join those if you want to. Uh, next week, Mitch Rahm of Dr. Backup will be our guest on December the 12th at 11 a.m., and you haven't gotten that email yet. Mitch can address many sales-related questions as well as technical. Uh, a lot of you know him from the Partners Forum where he's really active. Mitch has offered online backup services since 2001. He has more than 3,000 clients. Um, what we've been, uh, let me uh, uh, walk you through your console there. Uh, you've got a console. If you want to ask any questions or make any comments, then please type them in where it says questions. And one of us will see those and we'll answer you uh, uh, live. Um, let's see. I think that's all the housekeeping we have to do. Let me um, push a couple of buttons here. I'm going to drag some things to other screens. OK, here we go. Um, OK, um, one of the things that a lot of people asked about today is uh, best practices for designing a default client installer. And uh, this, is, um, this is something that a, a lot of people uh, want to hear about. And there are a lot of things that you can consider when you're doing this. Um, uh, as you know, uh, most of you have already bought the software and you've used it for a while. And as you know, the uh, server has, um, uh, let me just start one up here on screen so you can see it. Uh, this is the server software. Some of you have the RBS console application, that's this one, and some of you have the web manager. Uh, all of you, well, all of you have the RBS manager program, so we're going to use that one today to uh, generate a custom client installer. The, um, there, there are many considerations for designing your defaults. Um, there, there's branding. There's defaults. Let me show you some things here. Customized client installer. Um, there's a default schedule. There's uh, backup sets, default file selection. Um, there are client locks to worry about. There are uh, uh, text changes. If you want to do a lot of uh, branding to the system, you can. Um, these are other things that you can change, the icons and the splashes, splash screens. We're going we're gonna to change those today so you can see what that looks like. And then uh, uh, some other things, too, and even more things. But these are the simplest things over here. Um, best practices for designing the client installer uh, are on this page, which is uh, you can get to this from Quick Links. So go to our website, pick Quick Links, and then pick Best Practices and hit Go. And this is going to bring up, I think the best place to go to is Procedures. Uh, on the Procedures side, this is going to bring up a lot of uh, things that talk about the best way to do the branding and the customization. Um, this one talks about optimizing the time by identifying data that needs to be backed up. Uh, this one sets up proper backup strategies, and this one is uh, selecting specific files and folders to include and exclude. Uh, it's particularly important to exclude some files. Um, recovery point objectives, recovery time objectives, things like that. There's way too much here to go over uh, and do that subject justice. So what I think I'll do is just point you to this um, and let you read these things. And I'll answer some questions as we're doing the client customization and branding in a few minutes. Again, to get to here, go to the website, pick Quick Links, and then pull down to Best Practices and hit Go. Um, there are lots of best practices here on this page. There's uh, for, for sales and marketing, for technical, for procedures, and for business, business management. Procedures is the one that has the articles about the client customization. Uh, let's see. Let me uh, let me 
get to my agenda here. Okay. Um, uh, let me ask if uh, is Guru there? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I see. Okay. Uh, and are, are you having uh, issues logging into the uh, meeting? Yes, yes. Uh, I want the code again. I guess uh, there's uh, okay. one. Uh, the, the meeting code is, that uh, I sent you is correct. Um, maybe you sh uh, go to go to webinar. Uh, maybe go to webinar.com and pick join webinar and then uh, enter that in there if you, if you can. Um, uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll show all this. And, and we've got good audio with you, so uh, if there are any questions. Um, Guru is more geeky than I am, and so if there are some technical questions that you want answered or anything that I say wrong, <laughs> which is you know likely, um, Guru is going to speak up and handle it. Um, the way the customized client installer works is this. Uh, you fill in the blanks on these, these uh, forms here, and once you get this the way you want it, then you click this button that says Build Client Installer. And this little application will uh, package your client installer with all of the goodies that you've put in here, your new icons and your new bitmaps and all that stuff. Um, all of your defaults will be boiled down and uh, packaged into a, a one executable file that you can use to install your client. Uh, from this same screen, you can also build the restore agent. Uh, and you can also customize the help desk application if you thought that. Okay. Let's start with this. Uh, and I'm going to try to answer some more questions as well. Let me just look into the questions. Okay, nothing I need to answer right away. Okay. Um, on the scheduler, uh, you can and, and uh, stop. Don't stop me, but uh, answer. Uh, ask me questions if you don't understand something. Uh, uh, there with your go uh, go to webinar console. Um, okay, backup types can be incremental, differential, full, or bit backup. If anybody wants me to explain what those are, uh, then uh, enter a question. Otherwise, I'll assume you know what that all, that's all about. Um, the backup location is brand new with version 11.7.3, which is the latest version. That's the one we're working with today. In this version, you can select to send your, your backups to the RBS server, which is here, or to a local mirror location, which is here, or to a cloud service, which is here. Um, cloud service is something like uh, box.net or Google Drive or um, anything that any service that can map a cloud location to a, a local drive or a local folder. If you select cloud service, then uh, backups will be sent to that local folder, and then the driver that's associated with the cloud service will manage sending that up to the server, uh, up to the cloud. Uh, the local mirror is also a local location, can be a drive or a folder in the local environment, and that uh, produces uh, an exact copy of what's sent to the RBS server. So you can have a local mirror of everything that's sent to the RBS server. And on restore, if you have to do a big restore, the software just automatically knows where the, uh, the version of the file that you want is. And if, it is, if it's in the local mirror location, it'll get it from that. And in that case, uh, the restore goes very, very fast. Because it doesn't have to download. It's already local. Um, one interesting thing about this, uh, these, this cloud service setting is on the server side. Let me, this is an aside. Let me just let me just close this and show you something. Tools and uh, properties. Um, this is the server root folder. This is on the server side. This is where the uh, backup files will be stored on the server. Um, you can see that this is set to C colon backslash RBS, which means it's going to go to a folder on this C drive on this computer. If you send that folder, if, if you set this to a cloud drive uh, location, then the data will be sent from the client to, to this server and then immediately sent off to the cloud. So you won't store any of this data locally. Uh, it'll just pass through the RBS server and be sent to the cloud. 
that's that's kind of a side effect. We didn't intend to uh, intend to use that, but a few people have asked if it's possible, and that's yeah, it is. It works fine. Um, I don't know what you want to do with it. Uh, we uh, I, I don't know if you see any particular um, interest in that or, or reason to have it, but it's there. Uh, and Guru, will you let me know if you get logged in? Yeah, I'll do. I'll do. Okay. Um, uh, and Pinku might have the link too. If he's available, you could ask him. Um, all right, let's go to the customized client installer. Um, the basic settings, if you're, uh, is where you start. If you're going to use the server locator, you can click this button and it'll automatically uh, type in your server locator host name. The server locator host name, as you probably know, is your serial number plus these last, uh, this last bit here. And uh, the server locator is a dynamic DNS service that we provide to people with uh, maintenance contracts that are active. And uh, it's used to uh, provide a, a non-changing host name for, for a dynamic IP address. So you can run your server on a, a dynamic IP address if you want to. It can also be used for uh, backup DNS. A lot of people use it for uh, instead of a static IP address. Um, we recommend strongly that you don't put an IP address in here because IP addresses can change. Even if it's a static IP address, you might want to move your server to a different server host or you might want to change your internet service provider. Um, in that case, your IP address is going to change and, you will, and you will, uh, your customers won't know where to find you. So even if you don't use our server locator service, use somebody's DNS. So you can type in something like this. Uh, a DNS name. Uh, for this demo, I'm going to use the uh, local host address because I'm going to install a client on this computer and I want it to be able to see the server on this computer and this server is at this IP address. Um, for backup sets, you can select your backup type, the backup location. You can set the schedule. Um, you can set uh, uh, on the auto select filter. The auto select filter is uh, you can turn that on or off. If you turn it on, this kind of bypasses the file selection menu and allows you to back up files by file extension. Uh, for example, if I wanted to back up, if I wanted to exclude temporary files, I could uh, do this. Uh, let's see, exclude, and it adds them to the exclude list. And those will be excluded globally. Uh, if I wanted to back up all of, uh, let's see, uh, let's pick something. Uh, well, uh, unpackaged author 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 wave files. I'd do this, and I'd click this, and I'd, that they would go to this. Um, when you use auto select, auto select allows you to uh, uh, not select files at all, except globally like this. And by default, the client software will pick those from whatever folder they're in. So it's pretty good if you don't know where your clients are storing their files. Uh, for, for this demo, I'm going to turn it off. Um, there were some questions about purge and retention settings. And uh, this, this is one of the major things that you want to think about when you're setting, uh, setting up all of your defaults for the client. Um, it's, it's usually best to set up uh, two or three backups. Seth Guru, talk to me about this, will you? Uh, uh, tell yes. me what your opinion is. I say put two or three backup sets in here as a default and set them. We're, we're seeing more people use this option lately, number of, back, of versions to keep online than we are uh, using purge files older than dates. Um, if you pick number of versions to keep online at three, that's going to keep three, the, 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 the most recent three copies of most files on the server. Uh, I would also click this one. Most people keep this clicked anyway. This ensures, it's kind of insurance that overrides these other two options in the case of uh, files that are, that are, um, uh, there's only one copy of and it's, uh, it's older than the most current one. Um, uh, Rob? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, just to add a point, uh, while creating a back, you know, creating backup sets, now it's wise enough to create backup sets according to 
to, to the frequency uh, in which the file changes. I mean, uh, this this helps in uh, setting up the not purge settings, uh, you know, accordingly. Meaning, uh, okay. Uh, including, you know, like including uh, uh, files that change daily and the files uh, that change not very frequently on the same backup set. You know, it will be pretty difficult to set up the purge settings. So it is wise yeah. enough to have separate backup sets according to the frequency of uh, the file. Uh, you know, uh, added to the backup set is changed. Sure, and you can have uh, an unlimited number of backup sets. Uh, you might have one backup set that uh, detects files daily that, that were changed daily and uh, keeps uh, the latest three versions of those files. Um, you might also have another backup set that backs up weekly and keeps only the latest one version of that. Of that. And a, a, a case in point would be uh, system state. Uh, system state is sometimes big. You might want to back that up just once a week, and you might want to keep just one copy of it. Uh, it's not nearly as critical as things like Exchange, where you might want a completely different backup set for Exchange. Uh, in the case of mail items, you might have to keep those for a year. There might be some regulation that is in play that you have to uh, work toward. Uh, let's see, then we've got uh, file selection criteria, and then you can uh, log off and shut down if you want uh, at the end of a backup. Let's see, backup exclusions are particularly important, especially if you, get your, if you allow your clients to select their own files. Uh, end users don't often know which files to exclude, and so they just pick all of the drive, and then that's going to uh, send an awful lot of data to your server, and they're going to wonder why their bill is so high. So we included these global wildcard file exclusions. Uh, these file exclusions uh, allow you to completely eliminate the display of these files from the user interface. So they're, they're not even there for the user to select. In this case, we've got, uh, as a demo, we've got wildcard file exclusions that include tilde and an asterisk. What that means is any file that starts with a tilde is going to be ignored. Uh, any file, usually a file that starts with a tilde is, is uh, a temporary file and doesn't need to be backed up or restored. And then there are folder exclusions too. Uh, you can exclude the recycle bin, which is called recycler and recycle bin in different, for, uh, different versions of Windows separate all these by semicolon. Everything I'm telling you is in the documentation. So I'm, I'm actually going to rush through some of this. And uh, most of you know this anyway. Uh, I want to get to the, to the part where, we're, where we brand it. Uh, Roger has asked a question. He wants to know if the purge and retention settings will be relayed to the client on the next contact to the server, uh, or is the action done on the next session? Um, Roger, what we're doing here is defining the, um, the default settings for your client installer. This uh, has nothing to do with updating the client. Uh, to update the client, you, you can do that, and uh, I'll show you where. Uh, here on the RBS server, you can, you can uh, remote manage this customer, and you can change things here. So as, as you, and here are the purge and retention settings. So as you change these, the next time the uh, end user logs in for a backup, he will download these changes and apply them. I think it's at the end of the backup session. Yes, you are correct. Rob. OK, good. Let's see. That's all in the basic stuff. Um, to, to get it working uh, for the first time here, let's uh, let me let me make sure I've got this exactly the way I want it. No, I want to do a full backup on demand. Uh, backing up to the RBS server. OK, all right. Uh, then you can change some text. Uh, some text here, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply some customization to this. So I'm going to include a different name. I'm going to change the name on the screen captions to uh, Rob's RBS service. 
Um, here I can also add more menus, and I can all, I can add two menus. I can include my end user, my own end user license agreement if I want. Client locks are the next one, and client locks allow you to turn things off on the client software. Um, you might want to lock the ability for the customer to change the schedule. Uh, you might want to lock the entire backup set menu. It just turns these features off. Uh, some service providers find that if they give their clients access to the complete system, all the controls in it, they they will uh, change them. And sometimes that uh, uh, affects your billing, your cost of doing business, and so uh, it would pass through to the client. It's hard to do that. Uh, here's where we change the display, and I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to change this. Uh, the splash screen, I'll show you the default splash screen that comes with it. This says remote backup system. Well, it's going to open in Pinchup Pro. OK, that's all right. This just takes a while to load. Then um, uh, the, uh, you can also change the About screen. And this is the one that comes up when you type Help and About. OK, here's the default screen that comes with it. Let me move that aside. And we're going to change that to one of these. So I'm going to change the splash screen to Uh, let's see, where is the, uh, where is the, uh, oh, I see, I see, I see, I know what I'm doing. C, demo, my drive's kind of full. And graphics. Uh, let's change, this is the splash screen, I'm going to change it to this one. Oh, the file names have to be the same. Okay, we can change that. That would already be about, wouldn't it? And this one is RB splash. Okay, let's do it again. RB splash and RB about. Oh, again, I goofed up. That's supposed to be RB. Change it here. Didn't change here. Okay, I'll type it in. Well, that's not working. Um, <laughs> okay, I don't know what Windows has done here, but I, I, all right. So we're going to be able to change the splash screen, but not the about screen, uh, even though I've changed it over here. Uh, in Windows, uh, Windows over here doesn't recognize that the file name has been changed. Uh, let's, let's change some icons too. Uh, this is RB icon. It's called RB. Yep. And this one is called icon one. This one is called icon three. This one is called icon four. Okay. I can also change the icons in the executable files if I want to. Um, show you how to do that. Uh, you can, here's the uh, uh, software. This, look at this icon. This says rbackup.exe and it's got the default icon. I'm going to change that to uh, uh, 32 by 32. Well, I don't have a 32 by 32 pixel icon, so I'm going to leave it the same. All right. So that changes. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and apply this just to make sure all my changes are safe. OK, then uh, I'll show you backup settings. Uh, backup settings is where, you can, um, it's where you can change the encryption method. If you're going to use, uh, if you have to comply with HIPAA or Sarbanes-Oxley or GLB or some kind of uh, privacy regulation, it's best to use AES-256. Uh, Blowfish is more secure, but uh, AES-256 uh, is 256-bit is encryption. And it has, uh, uh, it, it's a government standard. Uh, all of this stuff is good. This is good. Uh, this is, if you want to change the temporary file path, you can here and here. 
uh, I always uh, exclude hidden in system and read-only files um, and all this stuff. Advanced things, uh, we won't get into that. But this is well. I'll tell you a little bit about it. This is you may want to change the start mode. Uh, the start mode is uh, defines which interface for the client software we're going to use. There's a simple interface and an advanced interface. Uh, let's start this with the uh, simple interface. And then you can see more advanced options here. You can set a maximum file size limit. You can set a, a free space threshold. Um, you can enable pause. You can This is where you enable local backup and the cloud. Uh, now, your server has to be enabled for the cloud in order to use this, and mine isn't. Uh, but uh, here's where you would enter the cloud path and the local path. Okay, let's make sure I've changed everything I need to change. Uh, backup scheduler auto select filters off. Purge and retention is correct. Um, okay, now all of this, all of this stuff I just did with the backup sets relates to the backup set named default. Uh, like we said before, you may want to uh, add two or three backup sets uh, for default. In that case, you would click new set and you would give it a name and uh, uh, you would enter a new backup set. And so one of them might be called uh, exchange, one of them might be called daily, one of them might be called uh, Microsoft Office documents. And uh, each one of those backup sets will run and it will run on the schedule. And uh, uh, let's see, uh, Jose wants to know if the cloud path has to be a locally defined drive or a URL. It has to be a locally defined drive. Because or, or or folder because the way the cloud backup works is it copies files into a local location, which is then uh, which is then backed up to the cloud automatically by whatever uh, application came from the cloud service provider. So our software handles passing it off to that application, and that application handles moving it up into the cloud. Um, Let's see, Jose also wants to know what, what if you turn off a feature but you want to turn it back on again? Uh, sure, that's fine. The, the uh, client, he's talking about the client lock screen. The client lock screen is where you turn features on and off. Uh, you can turn features off here and then uh, again, like I showed you before, you can go over to the RBS manager and right click and pick remote manage for individual users. And you can change, you can edit their client locks individually here. And this can be done after you've installed it. OK. Uh, I am satisfied with this. So I'm going to click Build Client Installer. And uh, then I'm going to build a self-extracting executable. I'm going to give it the file name demo. I will not digitally find this one. And the destination folder is, I'm going to put it over here uh, where it shows up on the screen. OK, let's see. That is uh, not my documents. It's my computer, drive C, demo. OK. Uh, the icon file, I'm going to use the default icon file. And I have set this to build all three editions, the personal, the desktop, and the server edition. So now all I have to do is click, click this to make it. And as you can see, it's beginning to build all three of them. OK. It created those just fine. And as you can see, it put in the new, uh, the new icon. This is the icon that I selected. Uh, whereas this one is the default icon for RBS for, for our, our RBS software, uh, this is the customized icon, and this will show up uh, in various places. So, all right, now we've got the uh, we've got the three editions of the client software built, and to install these, we just uh, send them to the client or take them to the client and double click them, and they they they'll run. Uh, let's install a, a desktop edition on this computer. And so I'll double click that. I'm going to turn this server software off while I'm doing this. OK. Um, this is the install wizard. This is where, where it uh, begins. 
and I accept the agreement. I want it in this file location. While this is installing, uh, let me look through the questions here. Uh, Jim wants to know when it would be the best choice to pick bit backup as opposed to the others, and I'll tell you that. Uh, bit backup is used for uh, large files that change a little bit. Uh, bit backup is our subfile backup technology, and it will select just the piece of a file that has changed, and it'll send that piece up for backup so you don't have to transmit the whole file every time. So a good application for that would be um, uh, CAD drawings. Uh, CAD drawings are um, usually really big and they usually change just a little bit. All right, notice this is the splash screen. Here's the splash screen that we um, that we produced. Notice down here this says Rob's RBS service. Remember we changed that uh, so it doesn't say remote backup anymore. Um, We've got our brand new icon here, and it says Rob's backup service and the brand new icon. Uh, let's call this a new registration. Demo password register. Encryption key. Normally, I'm going to say yes, but. Uh, I mean, you, you really should say yes to this. I'm going to say no. This is the form. This is called the encryption key info form. And notice that it's got our, our new icon on it. Um, the encrypt, please print this. When you install this, please print it. Uh, if your customer forgets his encryption key or loses the key file, or, or like I just did, doesn't create a key file, um, this form is the only thing that's going to help him get his data back without a key escrow uh, procedure. And that, that costs $500. We don't like to do them. Um, but uh, this has everything your customer will need to restore his data in case he completely loses that client software. If it's completely gone, uh, he can, he can uh, reinstall the software and uh, type all this stuff into it. And then it'll, it'll, it'll log into the same account as before and download the data that needs to be restored. Um, OK. The client software is running down here in the system tray. You can see the little uh, little icon there. I'm going to restart the RBS server now. And let's uh, wake this up and do a test connection. Um, remember when we told it to uh, start up with the simple interface? Uh, there are two interfaces to the client software. This one that we call the simple interface because, it well, it looks real simple. Um, uh, when it first starts up, it wants to make sure that you've got a good backup set selected. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and select some, some files to back up. Uh, let's pick demo. I've got some already here, so I'm going to, uh, there are 50 files, demo, and uh, let's see, I want RBS demo large. So I'm going to select uh, RBS demo large, click that, and then pick next. Backup schedule, like I set in the, uh, remember when I set this in the um, uh, customized client installer, we set it to on demand and full. These are all the defaults that we set up before we installed this. OK, finish. Let's test the connection to make sure it works. I'm going to drag this aside so you can watch both of them. We've got the client software, that's this one, running on the same computer as the server software. This is the server software. So you'll be able to, I'm going to test the connection now. And what that's going to do, uh, it'll do a, a test backup and a test restore to the server just to make sure that everything is connected properly. And you'll be able to see it log in, too. Uh, all right, here it goes. And see where it logged in here on the server? Uh, it was very fast because it's on the same computer, so the IP stack is real short. Um, it did all these tests, so it works fine. And now it'll now it'll do a backup. Uh, let's do a backup. Let's do a backup of the default backup set. And that's 50 files that I've pre-selected. And here it goes. So what it does now is it scans the files. Uh, it uh, prepares the files, and then it transmits them. It's, it's all done now. It uh, looks like it only transferred three because I must have set it to 
something. I wonder, I wonder what happened to this through this sim three file. Well, let me. Um, at any rate, so, so let me switch. To, let me show you the two interfaces. Um, this one is the simple interface. I'm going to switch to the advanced interface. Um, if you are a technoid like me, you are going to want to look at this interface when you're out there working on it. Uh, this interface has all of the functions of of the client software right up front, and it's very, very fast. Um, you can see that it's all customized here. Uh, let's look at the, while we're in here, let's look at the About screen. Okay, ah, that's right, we didn't change that because uh, Windows wouldn't change the file name for me. So that one's still set to the old one, but uh, if, if uh, Windows had, had acted right, then it would have uh, changed that to the new one. Um, so, Let's see here. Um, let me. Let me uh, uh, what What should we do next, uh, Guru? Can you suggest something? Oh, Jose said he told me what I did wrong. I selected the wrong demo. Let me go check. Uh, pick the right one. Thanks, Jose. I picked the small one. Yep, <laughs> I sure did. Okay, I'm gonna deselect that one and select the demo large. Okay, fine. And then I'll save that, and then we'll do a run now. So this is going to do a, a bigger backup. Um, let's see. We've got another question. Uh, does the server define the credits used by a client depending on the type of client installed? It, it does, uh, but you can also change that. Uh, and once again, I'll, I'm going to show you how to chart. This was a this backup was completely successful. Um, here, let me show you how to change that. Back to the server, you go to accounts, and then you right click on the uh, account that you want, uh, and then you you pick edit use uh, edit the demo edit demo user uh, right here. Account type is server edition, desktop edition, or personal edition. This one defaults to server edition because I installed the demo serv setup.exe, this one. It'll default to whatever you install of these exe files, but after installation, you can change it. If you want to go back and change this to a desktop edition now or a personal edition, then uh, that's fine. You can do that. Uh, and next time the user logs in, he'll, log, he'll uh, uh, change. The, the software that gets installed on the, on the client is all the same. It just wakes up with different features turned on and off depending on which edition you, you've selected. If I install a server edition that uses four credits, if later after the installation I go back and change it to a desktop edition, then next time, the, uh, next time that client logs in, he'll pick up the features for the desktop edition and return two credits to this credit pool on the server. Likewise, if you want to change it from a workshop from a workstation edition, to, I'm sorry, desktop edition to a server edition, it'll subtract two credits from the pool. Um, how about uh, we do a, a restore just for fun. Let me um, uh, delete all these files. Um, locally, I'm going to delete all 50 of these files here. All right, they're deleted. Now, hopefully, the restore will work. Guru, you think it'll work? Yes. <laughs> I do too. All right. The restore interface. I'll tell you about the restore interfaces. There are three of them, uh, and they come from three different locations. This is the one that's built into the client software. The other two are disk-based restore and web-based restore. There is a file that you can uh, build and post on your website. I'll show it to you. It's this one, webrestore-setup.exe. This one gets built from uh, the our server. Uh, you can post this on your website, and customers can click it to download it. It's very small. It's only uh, uh, two megabytes. Or Couple of megabytes. Mm -hmm. And um, when, you, when you download and run this, it uh, asks you for your username and password and encryption key, and then it brings up this same interface, and you can restore files from there. I don't think I'm going to go through all the features that are available in this restore interface. I'm just going to do a quick restore. Uh, as you can see, I've got two of them here. There's RBS Demo. Let's see what's in there, three files. And then there's RBS Demo Large. That's the one I deleted. That's the one I want to uh, replace. So I'll click those and pick Start Restore. Tell it, uh, no, don't redirect it. And let's uh, go back to here and watch.
launch and come back in. There they are. The restore is very fast because that's downstream uh, data. And they're all back. And that's good because I've got to use these tomorrow. Uh, let me uh, scan for questions. Um, Uh, Jim wants to know if there's a conflict between any computer that already has an encrypted drive and uh, 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 applying additional encryption. Nope, there's no no problem with that because uh, when the, the when the client software gets that file, Windows is gonna, or, or your driver is going to decrypt it anyway. So it's going to be decrypted first, and then it'll be re-encrypted and sent up to the um, sent up to the client. That's the way I understand it. Was that a lie, Guru? Yes, yes, correct. You're right. It, it was? Okay, all right. <laughs> no, so I was right then, oh. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I think we're done with that. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, uh, go ahead. We've only got 17 minutes left, so I want to move on to a couple of more uh, questions that people wanted to see. Um, let me just read my my uh, documentation. Uh, most people wanted to see a quick demo of the web manager and the e-commerce plugin, but uh, I'm gonna. We'll probably go along with that. So what I'm gonna do is is uh, answer some questions first. Um, somebody wrote in, wanted to know uh, uh, that said they're migrating to, uh, data to a new array, uh, a lot of data, and wanted to know what the best way to do that is. And and here's how you do it. Uh, over here on the uh, over here on the server side, um, you first first stop the RBS server, and then uh, you pick tools and properties, and you select the server root folder to be the new array, and it's got to be addressed as a mapped drive letter. Um, now, what you have to do bef well before you do that, Guru, am I right about this? You got to copy all that data over there. Yes, correct. So I'm going to show you the, the I'm going to show you the uh, condition of this data as it lives on the drive. This is on my drive C in an RBS folder. So here it is. The data is stored on the RBS server in this format. First, there's a, a drive letter and a, a root folder, and then uh, below that there are folders for each user. So. Uh, we've got three users on here. One of them is called demo, and one of them is called info at remote-backup.com. One of them is called rob at remote-backup.com, which is my email address, by the way. And if you want to email me about this webinar or about any of the future ones, you can get me at that address. Inside each of these folders is just a bunch of files. And there are folders with weird names like uh, hexadecimal characters, um, there are strange files like this. These don't mean anything to you, but to the software, they mean a lot. Uh, let me find something that's got some actual data in it. Hang on. I guess I could sort this by last modified instead of wasting a lot of time. There we go. Um, these are the actual files that are stored uh, as they're stored by the uh, server. As you can see, they're stored in an encrypted and compressed format with a weird file extension and no file name at all and no folder name. This is one of the things that makes our software compliant with HIPAA and GLB and Sarbanes-Oxley and all that. Some software will store the original file names on the server, and that's incorrect. You shouldn't do that. Um, original file names can contain personal information like um, uh, John's uh, 2002 uh, heart bypass operation dot doc. In that case, if, you, know, you, you, sh you can't disclose that. Um, so uh, in order to stay compliant with all the privacy regulations all over the world, we do all kinds of things, and one of them is we change the file name. This file name is, uh, um, is fielded with a lot of information. One of those pieces of information is a digital signature that verifies the contents of the file. Uh, so we do a lot of, uh, of checking back and forth between the client and the server to make sure that the file got to the server in exactly the same form with no data loss at all. Uh, we also use lossless compression. Um, let's see here. I mean, let me look at some questions. Um, uh, let's see. Jay, uh, Jay's got a problem, uh, but 
but we're not going to be able, we won't be able to handle any specific tech support issues today uh, during the live webinar. But uh, uh, we can get somebody. I'll get somebody to deal with that uh, in person. Um, Roger wants to know how are virtual disks handled by RBS? Um, virtual disks like uh, uh, VMware and uh, uh, Hyper-V uh, drives like that uh, are back. It, it's, it's best not to use our backup to back up those huge, huge, huge files. They change too often, and our bit backup takes too long to scan through that file. Uh, rather, uh, run the client application inside the VM itself uh, so that it can see the, the files as their native file types instead of as uh, one big uh, incongruent mass of bits that changes all the time. Um, that way, you, you back up fewer uh, fewer bytes, and uh, it's a whole lot quicker. Um, okay, so when you move data from drive C to the to the array, this is the data that you move. All of this stuff, um, and when you copy it over there, I've got two things for you. I've got I've got uh, uh, let's see, two files I'm going to show you. Uh, let me. Copy this and drag this. Um, this is how to migrate your RBS server in case you want to migrate your RBS server. You, did, you didn't say you were going to, but I wanted everybody to see this. Um, to, to get to this article, if you ever need to move your server from one computer to another, um, check this article before you do, please. Uh, go to help.remote-backup.com, type in the word migrate here and you will find it. it's this number two article. Uh, it's the official procedure for how to migrate your RBS server to a different, uh, to a, to a different uh, computer. Now, this is what will be of, of special interest to you, the, uh, the, the person who wants to move so much data. Boy, we have uh, we tried and tried. We did a lot of tests and we discovered uh, a way to move six terabytes of data from one NAS device to another. Um, this, this was going to take uh, days, but we got it down to 30 hours. Uh, we moved six terabytes in 30 hours by using two programs at the same time. One of them uh, was an FTP program, believe it or not, and the other one was uh, an application called Rich Copy, which was written by Microsoft for internal use and then later released to the public as freeware. Rich Copy is great. It runs multiple threads. It's very fast. Um, we got six terabytes moved in 30 hours by running uh, three or four threads of FTP and three threads of rich, three threads of rich copy. Uh, so uh, again, well, this one uh, you can get to by uh, going to our blog. It's blog.remote-backup.com and type in supercharge. Um, all right. Let's cancel all that. Now let's uh, bring up uh, a browser and go have a look at the web manager. The web manager I'm going to show you today is on our is in our data center. Uh, it's it's uh, a demo uh, server that we have up there, and uh, it's uh, uh, you, you point it to point your browser at rbs-software.com. And you can click here to get. You can click here, and it'll ask you for uh, some information: your first name, last name, and all that stuff. Um, it'll email you a login or two logins actually for this site, and you can use those to log in and uh, view the web manager for yourself if you want to. I'm going to log in as admin. Um, Jay says his uh, uh, blog and site logins don't work. There's no login for the. There's no login required for the blog. Jay, and there is for the um, for the uh, help desk and for the partners forum. So if you want, you can uh, uh, you can email us or you can call us, and we can reset your passwords for you. Okay, credits. Uh, the web manager uh, is the the part. It's a it's a separate plugin sold. Uh, by RBS, and it puts a lot of the features of the RBS manager on a website. 
this again, this is the RBS manager. You st you will still have the RBS manager, uh, but uh, in addition, you'll have this web-based interface, which you can get at from anywhere. Um, the web interface has more features on it than the RBS manager, um, but it's only those that are needed by the RBS um, web manager and e-commerce solution by themselves. And we have the e-commerce solution built into this too. Um, there are a lot of things you can do with this, uh, and it's got some cool graphical reports that you can get at. Uh, this thing costs uh, $499 and includes installation. Uh, the e-commerce plugin is the thing that provides you with the uh, with the ability to well to do this. Uh, let me uh, bring up the website again, as an end user would see it, and uh, I can click. Uh, let's see, buy now. And it gives me the ability to buy the software online and pay for it. Uh, I'll show you how that works. Uh, if I wanted to buy this uh, product, which has 30 gigabytes and costs $10 a month, I would click Buy Now. And it brings me to an order form. Uh, I can enter a coupon code if I want to. If, if you, for, if you give, uh, give me a coupon code for 10% off or 20% off the first month or whatever, the, the uh, e-commerce plugin has the ability to manage those uh, those coupons. Um, you select the username, password. You enter all your personal information, uh, billing information, and then it gives you the ability to pay by either Visa, Mastercard, American Express, or Discover, and or PayPal. You can enter the credit card number and the verification number, expiry date, or you can pay by PayPal. Uh, you click here to accept the terms and conditions. The terms and conditions. Uh, you really should um, make sure that this is this is right because this limits your liability as a service provider, uh, and it's long. Um, you can use the one that uh, that comes with our software as uh, a form to start to start your own. You could use it just as it is if your lawyer approves it. Um, so the customer goes to your website and clicks "I accept the terms and conditions." Uh, I'm not going to do that because I haven't filled in the form, and it'll just give me an error. But uh, once done, it verifies the credit card, it charges the credit card, it sets the credit card up for, um, for monthly billing uh, in, the, in the amount of $10 per month, uh, which the e-commerce the, uh, e plugin will do automatically. So you'll just, uh, it'll do all of your recurring billing for you. And, um, and then it, down it compiles and downloads the software, and the customer installs it just like we did a minute ago. Uh, makes the exe file and then gives them a link to it. Um, there are back back to the administrative system. There are a lot of reports that you can pull. There's a disk resources report. Um, these are all the same reports that you can get from the RBS manager, the console application, but they're in uh, a different form and have different uh, options about it. For example, this one you can click here to edit this user. You can delete the user and his data, or you can view reports about the user here. You can also sort in real time by the account, um, the group account, or by the user. Uh, most of the reports are this way. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of things here that you can look at the log. Uh, you can click monitor and watch the uh, backups and restores as they come and go. This is a real-time screen. It's all Ajaxy, and also that it's uh, it, it pops up and off as, as customers come and go. It's kind of fun to watch late at night. You got nothing else to do. Um, let's see. For the setup, this is where you uh, can. This is the coupons manager. Uh, this is uh, this is the customized client installer. It's it has everything that the uh, that the other one has. So the one in the uh, uh, this. RBS manager, um, but it's it's a little different. It's I think it's easier to use because it has everything all in one location. Um, you'll recognize you'll recognize a lot of these. For example, from these screens in the web manager, you can do things uh, that in the RBS manager console application you would have to open a text file and change it to do. This does it all from forms, so it's quite a bit easier. Um, and the forms include uh, customization and branding, advanced customization. Uh, this is where you change the product name, uh, change the help title, change all kinds of things here. I won't go through the whole deal. 
uh, when you get orders in through the e-commerce plug-in, they show up on this screen. Um, and you also get an email about it. Uh, orders show up here uh, if they've been uh, automatically processed by the e-commerce plug-in through your credit card uh, your credit card clearinghouse. They'll show up with an off code, an authorization code here. Uh, to get some expanded info on this, you click, you click that and it'll tell you info about the uh, person that signed up. Um, as uh, monthly, as recurring billing happens, uh, you'll also see a recurring billing show up here, which which uh, shows up like uh, a monthly payment. Let's see. Oh, credit card processing houses that we use. We support uh, Authorize.net and Payflow Pro, which is a, a formerly a VeriSign product now owned by PayPal. We also support PayPal uh, Advanced. Payments Plus, what is it, Yuru? Let me go over here. Okay, we support PayPal, Express Checkout, Authorize.net, PayFlow Pro. Uh, bill Me Later, which is one that you would use if, you, if you're going to use other billing for, you, for this. If you've got clients, you're an MSP, you've got clients that you send a monthly bill to anyway, and you're going to add this on as an, uh, a separate line item, then you could pick Bill Me Later. And that way it won't ask you uh, when, customers, when customers go here to buy now. Uh, they won't be asked for any credit card information at all. Uh, offline credit card processing is for support of anything other than Authorize.net, PayFlow Pro, or PayPal. Um, this is if you've got your own terminal and you want to do offline processing, you, you will have to punch these orders into your terminal. Um, there are lots and lots of things that we can show you here. We're out of time. Um, there are. Uh, what I think I'll do is, is uh, uh, ask you to go to rbs-software.com, sign up for an admin uh, username. Let me show you how to do that again. Go to rbs-software.com and pick, click here to begin. Enter your information, email address, and pick submit. And it will email you instructions on how to log into this website and mess around with it. Um, this website, the, the, uh, the uh, web plugin, also provides a portal for your end users and a portal for group managers. It's also available in an, uh, an advanced uh, feature set that uh, is called um, multi-tenant. Uh, multi uh, this allows you to um, have partners yourself. So you could, you could uh, allow other people to have admin logins. Uh, if they're reselling the product for you, uh, they could have their own admin logins and be able to manage their own users. Uh, boy. I think we're going to have to end it here. Um, uh, I could go for another 10 or 15 minutes on some other uh, some of these questions, uh, but I think what I'll do is try to uh, answer those questions next week. Um, probably tomorrow we're going to send out an email that includes uh, instructions on how to join next week's webinar. It'll be at 11 a.m. on Wednesday. Uh, again, Mitch Rahm is going to be there, and he can answer some sales questions. He's, he's just fantastic. If anybody can sell this stuff, Mitch can. Uh, he's, he's been doing it for, oh gosh, 11 years and has 3,000 clients or so. Um, let me uh, make sure that I haven't left out anything. Uh, I recognize I've got a lot of questions here that I didn't get to. Um, uh, Peter asked something. Uh, uh, let me just uh, answer that. Uh, he says, when updating the RBS server with a newer version, do you have to redo all the settings or are they retained? They're all retained, Peter. Uh, when you're updating the server, just just run the update program. It retains everything and it's bulletproof. The uh, so's the client. When you update the client software, just run the original EXE file and it will uh, update all the DLLs and EXEs. It'll leave all of your uh, other stuff intact except for one thing, except for the icons inside the EXE files. You'll have to redo those. Um, the icons in those EXE files are are burned right into the EXE file. So when you replace it, when you overwrite it, you're going to overwrite that icon too. Some people don't realize that. Um, OK, all right. Uh, email me questions that I didn't answer, and I'll uh, get them answered for you. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs> right. OK, Roger Goodwin. Roger wants to know, uh, uh, he, he really wanted to hear about huge lava rocks raining down. Uh, but I'm sorry, really sorry we didn't get to that, Roger. Uh, we didn't have time for that. 
Um, okay, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Guru, and uh, um, Goodbye, Guru. watch <laughs> watch your uh, email for uh, next week's webinar. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.